Bialis, please. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. you know, the, um, well, first of all, thanks for having me back here. Um, the final presentation is very tricky because yesterday, especially, and today, earlier today, so full of really provocative ideas and thoughts, and I feel responsible to try to pull it together a little bit, so I'll try. Um, and the topic, as you're saying, Steve, you know, we chose this, and I have to say, you know, I've got a team from our group here in the room, and we really all worked on this, um, especially following last year's session, where we realized we're on, not, not only is the consumer on a journey, and patients are on journeys, we are on a journey. And, you know, we've got to do a lot of exploratory work and so on, take a lot of risks. And, you know, we're trying to contextualize that and organize that so it doesn't just feel like chaos. So we feel as though we really can run uh, profitable, metrics-producing businesses. So when we thought about the fundamentals of change, and, and Steve mentioned this, you know, communication strategy, sometimes it's even just the words we use. So if we get stuck in the convention of just uh, you know, retrospective language, which has baggage today, at, you know, man, many of the words we use, perhaps if we just start to use some different words, it'll spur some new thinking, some new energy, uh, and some new fun in our work. So that's where change the words, change the world comes in. I'll take you through a little bit more about that. Um, I've been asked a couple of times here, you know, so how did we get to this space? How is it that we are here? Uh, you know, talking about the future of healthcare and so on. I just wanted to share a little bit in terms of our team and myself and Joe and our management team and so on. We come from a very ver diverse background, uh, mostly in the healthcare industry, although I actually come out of journalism. Uh, I used to research and report on the industry. And now, you know, that was 20 years ago. Now I've been working in it in a consulting capacity, um, moving into it through J. Walter Thompson. So we've worked with um, a number of the folks in the room and a number of your companies for many years. We got to consumer healthcare by way of really the prescription drug industry. You know, that's, that was the, 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 you know, sort of the moving and shaking ground of um, a couple of decades ago. And we continue to work there. We continue to work in specialty drugs. We continue to work in biotech and biopharma. We've learned a lot of things about how the patient en uh, encounters and experiences healthcare and is, has access to products from those sides of our industry that have application here. Um, we ventured into CHC. I think we all share the experience of the Zyrtec switch one way or another, and, uh, but ventured into CHC because we always called it the happy side of healthcare. You know, sort of where people, the 80% who drive only 20% of cost, live and work and try to be healthy and try to learn and try to be as productive as they can be and go to work every day and so their employers care about their health. And, uh, the health insurance companies love them because they actually don't drive up costs, but they pay those high-end premiums. So, you know, we wanted to understand that part of, of the space and see if we couldn't bring something to those consumers that was relevant to them uh, and was valuable. So that's why I, I like to think of us as having the soul of a startup. We're hardly a startup. We've been around a really long time individually and, and together. But we want to keep that, that energy of a startup so that we see opportunity and not just problems and that we can envision solutions and fun things that allow us to, as I say, have fun doing our work and, um, and be involved in interesting communities and so on. So, you know, in terms of community, this is the ecosystem we run in. Um, my actual first work in healthcare went back to the payer space. So we were encountering the very first really, you know, outrageous formulary restrictions for brands that we thought if we had salespeople on the street, they would just pull through the volume. It's taken some time, but we've worked with a lot of industry leaders. We've worked with a lot of, um, you know, major associations and policy setting organizations in the industry. And it's, it's, it's that broad spectrum of experience that helps us. Uh, we also have a lot of fun. I, I mentioned on the earlier slide community. I just thought it would be fun to say that we don't only work in a very narrow context. We last year did a really interesting project for the Vatican and got to go to the Vatican and, and, and meet the Pope. So, uh, you know, that's why we come to the table today to say, you know, we try to keep our minds open enough. We try to have enough diversity of experience, diversity of clientele uh, to you know, be forced to think differently, to be forced to use some different, you know, lexicon from time to time. And our work basically falls into three buckets, you know, strategy, which is a huge bucket, obviously, but to, to, to echo 
some of Nicholas's opening comments, you know, this idea of your power. Your power is in lots of different places, and sometimes it gets a little scattered, or we count on it to be concentrated in one place. Really, there are different sources of power. Uh, data is obviously important, not just for measuring business performance, but for, for thinking about how we can empower uh, consumers and the digital spectrum that, you know, Coleman just talked about and people have been talking about for the past couple of days. So, in some ways, we think about self-care as, you know, s still limited by sort of a flat worldview. I mean, sales are flat. Uh, so if we think flat, we're going to get the result of flat. Uh, the reality is that, you know, we really have to get out of our comfort zone, <laughs> be a little bit daring and courageous, and undertake some journeys that perhaps could do things like revolutionize the way people think about the world and kickstart the economy at least our, the economy for our industry. So that's the opportunity, because even as it was true in Magellan's day, today, if we can find a sea route alternative, if we can figure out how to put these parts together that we've been talking about today, I mean, our aspiration isn't really just to be very rich. It's to do something very good. And if the companies become enriched by that and we all um, see our industries grow and our teams grow, then that's all a good thing. So how do we do that? Um, this comes from Joe. He always talks about the fact that change is hard. It really is. It's hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to think differently. It's hard to talk differently. It's hard to argue for a new way of going to market and new allocation of funding and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's good to just recognize that and say, you know, let's face it, culture prefers the continuous effort of what we know. Um, you already get the sense that we're not really conventional thinkers. We sort of know the conventions, and we try to rebel against that, at least as an exercise in almost everything. But it's not very easy, because lots of times the convention wins. So, um, but at least we'll bring that kind of thinking and energy, because it's important to get beyond the quick wins. We know we need the quick wins, but we also need a future. And we've talked about this today um, for the past uh, day and a half now um, as well, that not only do, is it the right business strategy, but you know, our society and our marketplace and our world really needs this. I mean, there is absolutely not enough money in healthcare for us to continue down the road we're going in. And of course, the 80% of us who hopefully it's us, uh, or at least mostly, um, who are not driving cost, I mean, the system is, 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 is running out of money. And so we've gotta find a way to awaken and to empower and to enliven the you know, zest for taking care of oneself and to understanding when and how to access care appropriately, and the CHC products, the OTC products, and even a lot of pharma products, we'll talk about this in a second, that realize that they've got con a consumer business. Um, there's so much more we can do. Uh, FDA, uh, we, you know, uh, Coleman just talked about that, and, and the switch panel talked about the fact that FDA with Ensure, they're looking for, for, for conditions that need to be managed, like hyperlipidemia and hypertension and so on to be in the hands of people so that when we get the diagnosis from a physician and perhaps get an, init an initial prescription, we can take over the responsibility from there because you know, the prescription does a portion, diet, exercise, the rest of what we do with our lives does the rest. So the health ecosystem is expanding. That's another really important point that earlier slide I had. Um, it used to be that you know, we went to the health plans to argue for formulary position. Now, they're talking about our consumers the same way we are. So suddenly, now we're competing for the consumer. We're not just competing for formulary position anymore. And so that's really interesting. And of course, you saw the panel here with United Healthcare and Kroger and j and J. I I mean, there are really interesting vertical integration opportunities, but we also have to recognize that you know, consumers are on the other side of that. And if we don't make it clear exactly how we want them to act, they're just, they're just really confused. So um, again, this is a summary. This has been said. But you know, consumers as we know it in the sort of spherical world life, they're very empowered by their technology. Um, we've all been telling stories out in the breaks and so on. But I've told the story of my daughter who got a new apartment and in three minutes ordered all of her mattresses online from her phone. Or you know, something that I thought you'd have to go to a store, you have to feel how the mattress feels and decide which kind you like. No, she said it had 32,000 reviews, and she trusted it and she just ordered the mattresses. It's a pretty expensive you know, um, gamble in, my, in my, my book, but for the 
you know, those the, the user generation of the future. That's This is just the way it's going to be. And to tell you the truth, next time I order mattresses, I'll be doing the same thing. I'm sure of it. Um, they're really getting smarter about spending, especially in healthcare. You know, with uh, the Affordable Care Act and with the uh, transparency around how much money is diverted through your payroll to your benefits and so on and so forth, people are starting to understand some of the costs that are um, being borne on their shoulders. And they're realizing, I put so much into this. You know, we in the OTC world wonder, and I know um, some, of it is, some of it is policy, but we wonder why those generics, like let's stay with, pick on Zyrtec for a little longer, why does cetirazine generic continue to grow for the use for the exact same indications that we have OTC? It's actually the consumer feels it's less expensive. If they're already at the doctor's office, they can get a prescription and then they can pay a $10 copay instead of $17 or $28 at shelf. So, you know, th th those are things that they're not, they're not strategic initiatives on the part of the consumer, but it's sort of low hanging fruit. You know, would I pay $10 more or just get a prescription? And so um, we have to be very, very careful that we understand that they do make a lot of decisions with their pocketbook. Um, they expect, and again, this just came up even this morning, that their uniqueness will be known, that they, that they are uh, interacted with as an individual, not as a population. And they are willing to share their data. We know that. I mean, we're all wearing wearables and you know, uploading data all over the place. And we talked about what happens if you do the 23andMe and you, ac you, know, you actually share it online. Who knows? But the, bo the bottom line is that this current uh, society is willing to share their information for a purpose. They just have to get some value back. In our self-care sort of still flat world, we haven't really figured out how to address them, how to do something meaningful for them. They're not really empowered. We haven't really empowered consumers to do anything. They're not even really demanding. They're not at the door beckoning for something that we can react to. We have to figure out what that is. And you know what? They're not really engaged. And, and the good news is that's everybody's problem. I just got back from Pittsburgh, where we met with the Pittsburgh Business Group on Health, so a whole you know, uh, coalition of employers, uh, you know, of the uh, Heinz and PNC Bank and so on and so forth. And their number one struggle is, how do we get our workforce engaged? So everybody's looking for engagement, so it's not like somebody won that already. That's still available for winning. And I think that it would be fantastic if this room were the, the leaders in all of that. Uh, so you know, consumers aren't finding innovation from us, nothing that they can put their arms around. Um, they're still forced to, you know, sort of deal with the store experience that Joe described earlier this morning where, you know, they're not exactly sure how to navigate that shelf. And they're perhaps a little bit confused by all the categories and what, when, and where. I know that we do a fair amount of uh, work looking at products that should be used by certain, certain segments and products that should not, even in the same category, right? There may be a product that's appropriate if you've got hypertension, but something that is less appropriate. For the most part, the data says the consumers have no idea about that. So there's a little bit of risk that's also being introduced in this lack of, lack of engagement and lack of our effectiveness in, in educating them. But as, as, as Steve Jobs says, it's really not the consumer's job to come and tell us what they want. They can't do it. They don't have the words. So we've got to understand they need us to sort of take a, quant a little bit of a quantum leap here and bring them the future so that they can be effective. And I was going to ask this, a follow-on question of Coleman, because I think that this is where it really starts to come together in terms of what can we do? We can probably do something by working together. Um, consumers don't really want 27 different ways to access an OTC product. Uh, you know, they don't want a whole lot of different diagnostic experiences. I mean, it's just too much. We just don't have enough time and bandwidth. So if there's a way for us to, as we've said before, bring them solutions, bring them some consistency, let them use their technology, uh, and make sure that, you know, we understand when they give, give us some information, it's held in, in private and it's secure and so on. But it also lives, uh, leads to a value-driven solution of some sort. So this is, these are actually not my words, these are really FDA's words, that comes from the insurance initiative. This is the idea of this better self-care life where, you know, the under-treatment, I mean, we have a real public health uh, uh, challenge with, we call it 
compliance and adherence, um, but we just have generally un under treatment. Some of it is lack of diagnosis, some of it is lack of continuation of therapy, et cetera, in really concerning areas, um, asthma, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. These are things that not only are they dangerous and, and concerning from a, a personal health perspective, but untreated with exacerbations, we've got emergency room visits, we've got all kinds of other burdens that come downstream. Um, um, you know, public health can be improved if people could have better access. We know that if you can, if you can use your cell phone to order an entire apartment full of mattresses, which actually are pretty good mattresses, I have to say, and, and they were up here, Lisa, I'll just endorse that. Um, uh, somebody's yesterday in, in one of the slides actually had it. Um, but if we, can, if we can give them that kind of access and then we allow them the information so that perhaps it's not the pharmacy questionnaire that's so burdensome even for a pharmacist who actually understands the information, but something that is much more automated and much more um, attractive and friendly and easy for consumers, then we can truly bring them into the dialogue, we can engage them, and we can give them the reins to run their self-care life. So we want to talk a little bit about how that might work and what some of the inputs might be. We've talked about some of it. Um, but before we get into the behind the scenes utility aspect of this, the important thing is that the front end of it will always be brand marketing and the kinds of commercialization strategies and working with distribution partners and so on. That never goes away. Uh, but the idea of you know, plugging in some back end uh, enablers is, um, it, just, it really just automates that process a little bit. So the brands and the brand teams continue to own, and actually I think of it as a really exciting future because it gets a little boring trying to run a brand when you can't do anything new. So this sort of opens up a whole new world, and not just digital for the sense, <laughs> sake of digital, but digital for the sake of relationships with, with uh, consumers. Of course, as we talked about, a lot of the products that could be part of this big future are a little complex, and the conditions they treat are a little complex, and therefore there are some issues that our session this morning talked about some of the issues. Um, perhaps, you know, there is, let's, let's pick on cholesterol lowering because we talked about it the whole, the whole day. I mean, one, let's make sure that nobody sees the name of this product, which they know they take as a prescription product, and when they see it on the shelf, OTC, or available in, in, in an OTC type of setting, they think, well, why would I, I don't need my prescription any longer. The truth is, in the case of, of cholesterol-lowering products, we'll have prescription doses and we'll have OTC starting doses. And the OTC availability is meant to be a step into care, not a step down from care. So diversion from care, stepping out of a higher, you know, a prescribed therapy, um, drug, drug interactions, these are the <coughs> kinds of things that FDA is really worried about, and rightly so. And making a more complex drug fax label has been tried and has been shown to be limiting. It's just we can't get the we can't get the statistical significance that FDA is looking for for safety, which is practically 100%. Um, so we've got to think about how do we how do we how do we address this issue? Um, as I say, the consumer consumers don't know the answers. They, it, you know, it's not that they're gaming the system every now and then, that, that may be the case, but for the most part, they, they're guessing, and guesses aren't good when it comes to LDL. So um, there are a couple of thoughts. There's no one answer to this question. This is really about a, you know, a joint strategy going forward that says, what can we learn? So um, in, the, in, the, in the RX world, there are a number of different products that for various reasons, mostly having to do with lack of formulary uptake, um, you know, adopt a consumer, direct to consumer approach to the marketplace. So this company is Orexogen. This is all public domain online. If you go to their website, you can see that uh, Orexogen's product is a, a weight loss medication. Uh, managed care doesn't really like weight loss drugs. They don't like to cover them. They're expensive and it's a huge uh, population. So they, they try to stay away if they can. So Orexidin was smart enough to say, you know what, then we'll go straight to consumers. Now, it's a prescribed drug. So not only do they have to have a direct to consumer message, but their message has to stop short of saying, see your doctor. They also now provide telemedicine consults for the prescribing of the product. They will then direct ship it, or they'll provide you with a prescription, e, you know, an e-prescription to whatever pharmacy you want. So this whole experience 
for a regulated, prescription-only product is online, very consumer-friendly, can really be done from your phone. Not only that, what does the resident have on the back end? They've got the consumer. They know this person. They know this person is opting into their product. They've opted into their service. They've taken advantage of the whole solution. And now they can start a relationship. So the engagement piece all of a sudden comes back into the mix. And this is happening today. Uh, so is this. This is Lemonade Health. So Lemonade Health has a very broad perspective. They, you can see the number of different uh, categories where they offer products. These are all prescription products. And on the back end is basically the same thing. You can get information and learn about it and go take your own course, or in terms of seeing your own physician, et cetera, or for these products, you can have a telehealth visit, plug and play, and get the prescription, have it e-prescribed, and it can show up at your CVS on the corner if that's, you know, if that's where you like to pick up your prescriptions. So, and you see, same day, online doctor visit for $25. This is all out of pocket at this point in time. There's not a lot of coverage for these particular consults, but you can get to these products. Um, in women's health, this is, this is Maven Health, and these are just women's health products. Same experience, you know, it's sort of, you know, here's a solution. You don't want to go have to see a physician. You can self, uh, you know, sort of diagnose with a consult online with a physician and have the product uh, prescribed and have access to it. I can't, I've got to include men if I'm including women. So Roman Health, uh, you know, you're welcome, uh, you know, is for, the, is, is, is for the men's health products. So, you know, this is all happening today. The idea of using the capabilities of the digital relationship with consumers and the intersection of healthcare providers, that's all happening today. And yet here we are in the self-care world sort of having, you know, having a hard time jumping into this. So the good news is we don't actually need a prescription or we may not need a prescription after the first prescription uh, if we can think in these terms going forward. So how can we do this in self-care? How can we take that same convention of, you know, we drive the traffic and awareness and brand building through the classic marketing mix, but instead of, you know, taking a trip to a retailer, is there some way to engage folks online? Well, half, the, half of the marketing is online already. So we've got more than half of probably the consumers who would ever be interested in the products coming to an online venue at one point or another. But even if they see a, a product display in an aisle, there can be a, a text message or who knows what it will be in, in another year or 18 months or two years. You know, whatever it is that then connects them to an online so that they can take a simple action to figure out if those products in those really adventurous categories could potentially be right for them. And that does, does two things for us. I think this ties to what we talked about yesterday in the um, nutritional and national, uh, natural foods uh, panel, which is personalization. If I give you a little bit of information, I want, to get the pers I want to get back a personalized plan. So there's a personalization component to this. And then, of course, there's also the access. So with the information that's been exchanged, access to products, et cetera, can be granted. Um, I want to just talk about that for a second. So you know, consumers don't have the answers. We've already established that. But the data exists. Um, in the pharma sector, we rely on the healthcare providers to plug the gaps. But in the consumer sector, we're going to have to rely on other sources of data. Some of the data will, could be uploads from the digital devices we just talked about, uploads from my wearable, uploads from a diagnostic tool, et cetera. But the other sets of data, there is a tremendous amount of healthcare data. Um, all of our claims data, all of our EMR data, all of our lab data. I mean, this is all now in the digital realm. It's used every day in healthcare for healthcare applications. Every uh, e-prescribing in interaction leverages that data because when a physician is prescribing for me, he's prescribing based on my profile, not a population-based profile. Um, and adjudication at the pharmacy, same thing. All of those checks take place. Every drug is checked for drug-drug interactions, et cetera. It all happens in, as they say at, the, um, uh, at Humana, 0.6 seconds. So 0.6 seconds to the glass for a pharmacist to have this information, but it's my information. And the current administration, and frankly, this is really not just the current administration. They've just made, they've just labeled it and put a brand to it called My Healthy Data. Uh, but the previous administration as well is very, very interested in allowing access uh, to that data for each consumer because we can't be empowered until we have our information. And the information is, is, is already collected and is being used for other purposes. So the My Healthy Data 
uh, and it's very interesting. I've, I've listened to um, uh, Secretary Azar speak. I've listened to um, Seema Varma from CMS speak. Um, they all have personal stories about, for Seema Varma, it's her husband had a health event. She couldn't get to his data. She didn't, you know, they needed some information in the emergency room that she couldn't get to. And, you know, so everybody has an N of one story, which is really compelling. So they are, you know, pers they are both personally committed and professionally committed to transparency and unlocking this data for consumers. So the data is coming, and a lot of it is already accessible, um, and more will be coming once, you know, in a flood uh, as this moves forward. As I said, here's the data, you know, 4 billion pharmacy claims per year, all there, personalized, individualized. We know the, do you know, the system, not me, not we, the system who holds this information has every dose, every <laughs> refill, et cetera. Uh, you know, medical claims um, and lab tests and so on, there, all of this data is is there, and it's used, as I say, in um, e-prescribing, so at the physician or point of care, and also in emergency room settings when an emergency comes in and there's no information on this person, whatever bits and pieces of data we can grab about them from licenses, et cetera, you know, taps into this data set on that individual. Uh, it's used every day in, in the adjudication process, so every time you walk up to a CVS pharmacy, to a Walgreens pharmacy, to a Kroger pharmacy, et cetera, it's used. So what we're proposing is there's another application, there's another use case for this data, and that's the consumer use case. And that is what this industry and all of, all of um, the discussions we've had in this room over the past day and a half, all of that gets enlivened and, and, and energized by access to this data. So, oh, hold on a second. Al. Okay, so we're going to a demo. I don't control that. So I shouldn't have clicked, sorry, we'll get back to that. Um, so this is a little bit of a, just a, a little interactive demo because it's hard to just show it inside. So this is going back to that basic con concept that you know consumers are engaged by the brand through the means that are the most productive means at the time, whatever they may be. Uh, nothing is cut out, so Joe talked about and, and, and. Yes, and, you know, things are changing. Uh, this proposition, and I think any proposition going forward, has to address the end. It has to include every option. And then based on strategy and business objectives, the ends can be turned on or off. So this model is about all about ends. So the consumer is engaged and um, clicks through to, yeah, I think I'd, I think I'd like to learn more. There are only a couple of bits of information that are necessary. Uh, this does tie into the back end healthcare system. So you know, name, that's not too hard for a consumer, date of birth. And then with a health ID card, immediate tapping into all of that claims data. That's all we need. That's all the system needs. That's all that's required. So anybody who has a portal with their healthcare provider, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, Anthem, Aetna, et cetera, this is, this is the simple login. You log in and it can check your health profile. So the idea is that behind the scenes are the same systems that adjudicate at pharmacy, the same systems that provide the data uh, at e-prescribing and so on. We're just, the pr proposition is to tap into those data sets and to allow an algorithm to run that is basically driven by the drug, la drug facts label that says, okay, you've got to check to see if this person has an 18 month history of drug X. Because if they've had drug X prescribed in that 18 months, this is medical strategy, of course, uh, it means that perhaps they have a cardiovascular condition or perhaps they uh, you know, have diabetes and somebody with diabetes is contraindicated for this product, et cetera. Whatever it is, there are algorithms that the claims data can check for us to make sure that we clear any of the hurdles. Perhaps that person who is interested isn't right. They're not going to get a big red X like on the Price is Right or whatever, what, uh, whatever shows my kids were watching last night. Um, but no, they'll get a really warm and engaging message. This is just a template, but I mean, this is the, another opportunity for the brand to say, okay, we know you're interested in this product. We understand you have concerns. However, there is something you need to talk about with your doctor. So this conversation can be as elongated or as truncated as is appropriate given any, any scenario. But this is where you can plug in those same things that we just saw Pharma using today or Lemonade using today, which is, do you want to chat with a doctor? Because we can give you access to that. Do you want some tips that you could you know, use as talking points when you go to see your doctor about this particular product and why you think you, it was right for you? you know, so this is an a true engagement opportunity. And remember, they've already opted in. So 
whether they're right or wrong for the product, they're still a, a consumer that's become engaged with, with your business. I'm not gonna leave. So let's take another scenario. Let's take you know, scenario two. This person goes through the same simple process. And, and, and remember, of course, I should say that you know, all of this stuff can be stored, so it's not as though this ha anybody has to go through this process over and over. It's just like your portal. Once you log in, as long as you know how to get back in, you can easily do that. Uh, but the same algorithm runs, and so checking against whatever the DFL, uh, do not use, warnings, et cetera, <laughs> components are, and this person um, has no hurdles, has no conflicts, so now they, they, they can be provided access. Um, the whole idea is point them back to the drug facts label because even though the algorithm check, they should understand the drug facts label as well. So constant access to the drug facts label is, is important. And then they get to, as you know, we, we heard in the, just in the last presentation, they should be ushered through an entire easy purchasing process. So maybe they want this product directly shipped to them. Maybe they want to pick up in a store. We, know, we heard yesterday about all of the new conventions for identifying uh, a recipient with, with a purchase, you know, in all different ways in these stores. So that process will, is also known today. It's not anything that has to be um, uh, made up. And it does, and I, I should say, we, the distribution model could be anything. It could be retail only, it could be direct, it could be retail and uh, perhaps a PBM. What's, what comes up here is an interesting component to send that information back into the health record. So as we're talking about compliance persistency now, we know the purchase, we know the person, we know where they got it, we can record it in their in now a record, which is something that frankly in the OTC industry we've suffered from because we don't have any tracking. We don't have any record to feed back. And when it comes to cardiovascular disease and some of the other areas where we're gonna potentially be, be providing access, we're gonna need to do that. So this information can now feed back into the record. So a prescriber can see, oh, Joe, you've been on 10 milligram Lipitor, you've, you, you know, you've been taking it, that's good. Now it's maybe time to move you up, and here's why. And now all of a sudden you've got a, an opted in consumer who understands cardiovascular risk, has already made some connections between the relationship with cholesterol and their cardiovascular health and has taken a step, perhaps even talked about it with the physician at the early stage, but you know, is empowered and is much more likely to remain some, somewhat compliant as they move up in their dosing. So, as we've said, we've talked about the various pickup locations. I mean, obviously, right now thinking about it, these products probably are not sitting on shelves. There can't be any chance that somebody's walking out with something that could have an adverse, you know, where there could be an adverse event uh, because the information wasn't properly vetted and that person wasn't properly vetted. But there's merchandising and there are these conventions now of picking a product in different places in the store. You know, the pharmacy could be one. It doesn't have to be BTC to be a pickup location. So the idea is that we have an ecosystem of data. It's out there, it's being used every day in healthcare for other purposes, we're just not using it in the consumer realm. Um, however, it's probably not something that we'll be doing one brand at a time. It's just not, it just can't. It's too, it's, it, this is almost like a utility that needs to sit behind our industry and power this future so we can realize the future. So, now I'm back on slides. So that's why we are announcing this morning with Nicholas Hall uh, and company, um, a consumer access consortium to start to think about this, to start to work on this, on, this, um, on this opportunity, let's call it. It's not really a challenge, it's really very exciting. So a couple of things to share. Um, we, as a team, have already done a fair amount of work on this and we actually took the concept to FDA through a pre-RFD process to say, does F, you know, do you have regulatory oversight on something like this? And FDA has said, yes, we do. And um, they provided very positive feedback. Now, of course, they haven't commented on Insure, and we know that there's that sort of thing, but the reality is they, um, you know, they have confirmed that this type of a process, this use of data, this is the kind of thing they're looking for to ensure the safety, safe use of these kinds of products and that they could regulate um, a scenario like this. It's essentially the technology or the device with the drug and it goes through the process. We've talked about how this process potentially 
changes the game in terms of knowing your consumers and not having to chase them after the pack after the purchase, you know, down the aisle and ask for store data so we can maybe match them back up to our product versus all the other products, et cetera. But instead knowing them from day one. Um, and so this and then driving data back into the healthcare system as a public health, you know, proposition. And then third is, you know, if we're ever concerned about actual use, we now have a way to to manage for that, to communicate around that, to um, report on that back to FDA. If we want to go to a next dose or a next product in a category that perhaps, uh, you know, we can build a case based on what we bring forward in the early stage. So there's a lot to think about. There, we do believe at this point in time, after, you know, I would say really, in fairness, about three years of work on this. Uh, across all the parties and with other parties. We've got you know, some of the clinical research groups with us and so on and so forth. Uh, worked with industry groups like NCPDP and so on. That it, it really is something that we should talk about holistically and that uh, needs to be done in some kind of a consortium kind of effort so that the consumer gets an experience but gets all the products. All the products that are right for them. Access, access through a simple and conventional way, and it's as easy, really, frankly, for the consumer over time as a Google search. There was one time, there was a time where everybody did their first Google search. Uh, you know, we'll have that day here, but then eventually it becomes a very comfortable convention. So that's hopefully a chance, uh, a, a, a little bit of a summary of all of the various bits and pieces um, of what we talked about over the past day and a half as well as a little bit of a thought in terms of where can we take it? How can we make this actionable? Because it's compelling to talk about all of this stuff, but we really actually do want to build the market out and make it something that we've dreamed about. Okay. Perfect, thank you, Mary Alice. And uh, we've got some time for some questions. Uh, before we ask Nicholas to come and give us the final words of the conference. So any questions? Can I start? Sure. Okay, yes. perfect. Um, so we're moving from uh, an industry which has been very focused on selling a product yes. and uh, advertising to the masses mm -hmm. to a future which is about being mm -hmm. a team player in an integrated healthcare Mm -hmm. uh, community mm -hmm. uh, that would have conversations with individuals. Right. It's a big jump. It's a big jump, yeah. How do we get there? What are the first steps that we can take uh, as individual companies on that journey? Oh, well, I mean, this is a little bit of a commercial, but part of it is, is to join the conversation, right? right? I mean, um, we can either wait for somebody else to plot the course mm -hmm. or take charge of it a little bit and, and start down that road together. Um, and put it all on the table. I mean, I don't. No one. No one's. No one's got the answer quite yet. We over a day and a half here have talked about bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, but that's the exciting future because I mean I've been around brand marketing now long enough to have run a million one-to-one -one campaigns. We couldn't get one-to-one. -one. So you know the idea that this is what we can achieve is really very exciting, and it's a side. Uh, side effects sort of, of of having to fix a problem or yeah. address a challenge. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Very exciting future. Any other questions? Perfect. Okay. All righty. Thank you well, so thank much. you. Thank you very much. Right. Well, that's the, uh, the end of uh, the uh, presentations through our speakers, and I'd like to invite Nicholas to come up to give us uh, some words in terms of the summary of the last one and a half days. Nicholas, please. Thank you, Steve. The world's largest collection of pens here. Um, I see in the audience my very good friend of many, many years, Dr. Bill Howard, and I remember some years ago when Bill and I were consulting, a client asked for some work and was shocked by the fee and said, but I only want you to look in your filing cabinet and take something out. It'll just take you a couple of hours. And Bill's response was, it's not the time it takes to take the information out. It was the 35 years it took to put the information in. Um, so my task in 15 minutes to summarize a day and a half 
is almost impossible because that day and a half is the quintessence of hundreds of years of combined wisdom. Having said that, that's what I'm built to do, and the show must go on. So, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful to my colleague, Kirsty McWilliams, who, um, who's been writing down all the key statements of our speakers over the last few days. So, Pat O'Leary, who came in after the, uh, the keynote speech, Pat from Greenwood Group, he said, he gave his insights on e-commerce revolution and showed how some brick and mortar retailers are fighting back against Amazon. After that, Dave Wenland from the Hamaker Group, he debunked five myths surrounding independent pharmacy, stressing the strong opportunities there. And I think that was an eye-opener for many people subsequently who said they didn't realize that independent pharmacy was so big and so important. Amit Dand of Nailbiter showed us that the top five uh, marketer mistakes in drugstores that independent pharmacies and large chains can learn from can be re revealed by video metrics. And Ted Kyle, founder of Conscient Health, talked about the obesity and diabetes crisis in the US. Alexis Roberts, uh, Roberts McIntosh gave a fascinating talk stressing that despite the storm in healthcare, there is great opportunity for marketers who pivot the agenda towards health outcomes. June Rissa from Nestle Health Science, Skin Science, uh, shared insights on the success of the prescription to OTC switch of different gel in the US. Uh, Steve Salby and Ed Rowland uh, uh, launched the CHC Training Institute of North America, and Terry Goldstein and Joe Giaconda delivered a talk on how to protect brands against malpractice. John Halbert of uh, Life to, Life's Too Good talked about the factors behind the success of hair loss brand Viviscal. And my good friend Jennifer Cooper of LPS Health Discovery gave a compelling talk on the upcoming surge in personalized medicine. And Thomas Ar Tom Arts, co-founder of Nutrition Business Journal, gave his insights on the current trend in nutrition. And uh, Chuck Jolly, who's here somewhere, and many thanks to Chuck. I want to say thank to him, thanks again to him in a moment from Baker Donaldson gave the final talk of the day yesterday on the unique and legal possibilities of medical foods. And again, that for many of us was a real eye-opener. This morning, Joe McGovern from Everything Health kicked off proceedings with a review of the key issues in Switch, stressing that OTC has a big future, but a different future with new technologies and channels. And Vidu Dev from GSK, and I'm very pleased to say we have a great photograph of you this year because last year you looked very grumpy and I know that's not your, your personality. Today we have a great smiley photograph that we've already put on the internet. So thanks to you, uh, Vidu, for presenting um, the industry's wish list for the FDA to ease the switch process. And Joe Gitchell of Pinney uh, discussed the future of nicotine with the FDA looking towards tackling nicotine with a comprehensive plan and there are opportunities for self-care there. And I have to say, as, some, as a militant non-smoker who once ran a $300 million tobacco business, um, I, I have so much guilt and that uh, it's good to see that there is possibly uh, a, a future for life after tobacco, even for a militant non-smoker who's never smoked. Uh, Michael Hufford of Harm Reduction, what a great presentation that was. And I think uh, there are many of us who would like to join uh, the work he's doing on a pro bono basis. And he stressed the case for OTC naloxone amid the opioid crisis. And Coleman Bigelow from Google, I don't know if Coleman's still here, but sort of nice to see that you're still keeping your links with the industry you used to work with. And you showed us how we can provide magical digital experiences along all the stages of the patient journey in the age of the best and the land of now. And my very good friend, Mer Mary Alice Lawless from Everything Health, delivered a compelling call to action to OTC marketers to change the words, change the world. And at the point that Kirsty finished this, um, uh, this little summary, um, Mary Alice hadn't introduced by then the Biograph. But Biograph is an exciting tool for encouraging and making possible switches in very difficult categories. And I hope you will join us in this consortium so that as an industry, we can uh, get the switch process moving again. So what all these speakers have done have shown us unlimited opportunity with an industry that in the United States is not performing well. Now yesterday when I said that the US was growing at about 2.5% a year, I didn't have the latest data. 
And the latest data is even worse. The last quarter that we've measured is only 2.1% growth, MAT, in the United States, slightly better in Canada. So here we have this world of opportunity, this country of opportunity, this region of opportunity, and yet the sales figures are shrinking. Maybe that's because we're not measuring multi-level. Maybe that's because we're not measuring e-pharmacy. But there is an opportunity out there. Now I have to move to another device because this is a very impromptu presentation. And I wanted to read if I can find it, and I hope I can find it. Um, I have it on my phone. Uh, 17 years ago, we launched OTC Newsflash, and we've covered um, about 25,000 stories. And I just wanted to take, if I can find it, and I might not be able to find it, I just want to uh, take you through some of the stories that we'll be covering in tomorrow's issue because they are very relevant and I think, again, just shows how much change there is in our industry. Even though the sales seem not to improve very much, the change is enormous. So, for example, tomorrow we'll be reporting that, um, that amazing Mexican company, Genoma, Genoma Labs USA, has acquired the Buffering brand. So there's a famous old brand now in the hands of a great marketeer. Outside of the United States, buyer and the e-commerce platform JD.com, which is one of the leaders, it's not quite as big as Alibaba, but it's um, in that league, has buyer and JD.com have signed a strategic framework agreement for China. Alliance Pharma has agreed to acqu acquire exclusive marketing rights to Nizaral as j, j sells off the mid-sized brands. So uh, the, that medicated anti-dandruff shampoo, um, uh, uh, this is for Asia Pacific. The brand, is, of course, is up for sale in uh, other parts of the world. That's uh, being sold for 60, 60 million pounds, it says here, so about uh, 80 million dollars. Also in Asia is the A.S. Watson's chain, which we don't talk about very much when we think of global retailing in health and beauty. We talk about uh, uh, the um, Walgreens Boots Alliance. We talk about CVS. We talk about Walmart. Um, but this is, a, this is a powerful retailing giant, and for the third year in a row, A.S. Watson announced its plan to open over 1,300 new stores. That's one new store opening every seven hours. At the moment, A.S. Watson is mainly focused on beauty and hygiene. My suspicion is they're going to fall in love with healthcare very soon, and that will become one of our biggest, if not the biggest, global retailer of consumer healthcare products. A new study published in, uh, in JAMA Pediatrics shows that since 2003, the use of alternative medicines, such as herbal products and nutraceuticals, amongst children has doubled. So again, we heard about the trend towards natural products. The use of medical cannabis is to be reviewed in the UK and could lead to more prescriptions of drugs made from the plant, says the British government which can think about other things than Brexit. The food supplements will now be treated as a single category of products in Brazil. That means that there's going to be a much easier path for these nutritional products uh, in the biggest market in Latin America that accounts for over 50%. Merck has announced moves designed to pave the way for an even more successful future in China, including an agreement with Ali Health which I really think within the Alibaba empire is going to emerge as the most important digital giant. I really do think this is going to overtake Amazon, it's going to overtake Facebook, Google, all of these. This is the power of the East and it's going global. Private equity group CVC is in advanced discussions to acquire a controlling interest worth more than three billion euros in the pharmaceutical uh, business of Italy's billionaire Recordati business. That's a great Italian company spreading out worldwide with a great consumer healthcare business. I know we support it to an extent. Uh, Steve Sowerby and, the, and the, uh, the training academy were there on Monday talking to them about supporting. Very germane because of all the discussions we've had on diabetes. Nearly half of people living with diabetes in the United States have gone without care because they cannot afford it. Now, if ever there was a crying need to provide adjacent products through consumer health care, this is it. And we've all heard so many references 
to the growth of diabetes as a medical condition. Almost half of consumers prefer generics to brands when making purchasing decisions in pharmacies in Brazil. Generics is a huge threat, bigger, I suspect, than even we think. The Drugs Controller General in India has asked pharmacies to create shelves that exclusively stock generics. Now, we saw my last one, of course, uh, all, uh, most of the companies in, uh, in this room do read OTC News Flash. We have 9,500 readers. I think after Drugstore News, we're the biggest publisher. And uh, we won't even talk about quality, of course. Um, as Ed, who apparently is the most read uh, journalist, is uh, in the room. Um, we saw earlier a reference to that wonderful statement from Albert Einstein, which said that um, uh, the infinity, there are only two infinite characteristics, the universe and man's stupidity. I had another one, which is that the two um, most common elements in the world are hydrogen and stupidity. So whoever wrote that quote and uh, Albert Einstein are in line. And how stupid could Burger King have got when they apologized this week for running an advertisement which offered free burgers to Russian women who get pregnant by World Cup football players. That's a little bit like that uh, video I started with, with Mr. Kim and Mr. Moon walking out and the trap door opens. I'm just astonished at what companies will do because clearly the brain is disengaged when they make announcements and they run competitions like that. So how do we sum all of that up? Today's news, this week's news, which point us in so many new directions, the combined wisdom of this audience, the speakers, the delegates, those who've asked questions, the panelists and the like, which show this amazing opportunity. How do we break out of this low rate of growth globally at 4%? Just I showed you 4.4% for the forecast this year. It's probably going to be closer to 4.1. Now we have the quarter one data. And in the US, 2.1 down even from 2.5%. It comes back to the icon, Samo Farah, who says we just have to pick up the pace in the area of pharmacy, adjacencies, career, and a, a, a consumer, and e-commerce. So that's the message we, we leave, and it's a fragmented, but hopefully a valuable message. This is the point when I close with some thanks. So I want to thank our sponsor, Baker Donaldson, and the wonderful Chuck Jolly, who supported us for the second year. All the speakers, and we've had many speakers and panelists, um, the chair, I'm still very old-fashioned, so I'm going to call them chair men, even th though there were ladies there. In my office, I'm told we have to call them chairs. Um, and um, we, had, we had a few jokes at our last conference when one of, one of my colleagues said, we're no longer going to have tables, and therefore the chairs will not have tables. And that just sounded all, all the more like furniture rather than people. But anyway, our chair, our chair people... Uh, uh, on this journey of the day and a half were Ed, Ed Rowland, Liz Cummings, Joe McGovern, Mary Alice Lawless, Steve Sowerby, and Chuck Jolly. So thanks to them. Thanks, of course, to Everything Health, our co-sponsors of this conference, to, um, to Mary Montero and her team, um, to absent friends, um, to those who are normally here but aren't here this time. That's uh, Leanne Hill, Philomena Pede, and... Um, Jen O'Donnell, who yesterday delivered a baby daughter, so we ha she has a very good excuse for not being here. To our film unit with, um, with, with my son Jacob, to, uh, to James and to Scarlett, who's come from San Diego to help us, to the AV team that's not let us down at all. Of course, to all of you delegates, those here, those who were here yesterday, those who unfortunately couldn't come, but in total 120 signed up for this. Please don't forget, this is our Bible. These are the evaluation forms which will enable us to make next year's meeting in New Jersey at the same time, possibly in this hotel, to make that meeting as good or better as this year, just like this year's meeting was as good or slightly better than last year. So please help us with that. Uh, we will be here next year, and we hope to see you. Uh, and please, 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 if you have a message to give that's not a pitch, if you have a story, if you have, if you have a case study, if you have a vision, this journey requires all of that. The stories, the case studies, the visions and the like. Do not be shy. Most of the speakers today and yesterday were volunteers. And we want you to start thinking about volunteering for next year's wonderful conference 
which is all about enabling consumer self-care. So on that happy note, I invite you some half an hour early to join us for the networking lunch. I hope you will be able to stay for that so that we can continue the discussions informally that we've had so wonderfully over the last day and a half. So on that note, I close this conference and invite you to join us for the networking lunch. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.